flight of a hummingbird, the sprint of a cheetah, the breath of a whale, a daisy turning towards the sunlight. Given the complexity of the natural world, we can understand why, before the publication of Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species, people believed that the universe was the work of an intelligent designer. These days, however, although creationism continues to be defended by religious fundamentalists, the scientific consensus is that the world's organisms evolved through the long and arduous process of natural selection. With a complete physical explanation, say the new atheists, there's no need to appeal to the supernatural. In this interview, we'll be discussing atheism with Professor Richard Dawkins. It's no exaggeration to say that Richard is one of the most influential scientists and the most famous atheist of all time. Alongside his invaluable contributions to evolutionary biology, his books including The Selfish Gene, The Blind Watchmaker and The God Delusion have a readership in the tens of millions, resulting in numerous prestigious awards and recognition as the world's top thinker. Although atheism might have been logically tenable before Darwin, says Dawkins, Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. It is time we seize that opportunity, that we embrace the godless universe, craft our own meaning, and stop suffering fools gladly. Hello and welcome to episode 108 of the Pan Psycast. I'm the delusional Jack Symes and I'm joined once again by the devil's chaplain that is Rose de Castellan. Hello. And the teapot agnostic that is Professor Richard Dawkins. It's great to have you on the show, Richard. Thank, Thank you very much. So the first question we ask all of our guests, what is philosophy? What is philosophy? Mm -hmm. I sometimes wonder myself. Um, <laughs> I suppose philosophy is the study of how we think, of what we mean by words, the questions that we need to be asking. I never quite know why scientists can't do the job themselves, mm -hmm. and to some extent we try to do so. I suppose philosophers have the advantage of a long history of past philosophers from Plato onwards, so they know what kind of mistakes have been made in the past, and so they have something to contribute, and I think in particular, I admire the philosophical technique of the thought experiment, the mm. Gedanken experiment, which I find a very useful trick for thinking myself. When we spoke to your colleague Daniel Dennett, one of the other four horsemen of new atheism, he said, the job of philosophy is to figure out the questions and pass them on to science. Philosophy itself can't make any progress. For that, you need science. Would you agree with that characterization of the two fields? Well, yes, I think I would. I I think scientists don't do a bad job of figuring out the questions themselves, but yes, apart from that. So how did you become interested in questions of philosophy and science? So questions of God, evolution and the origin of life. What was it that sparked your interest? I've always been a bookish sort of person and the way I drifted into biology was mainly through an interest in the deep questions of existence. Mm. What fascinates me about Darwinian evolution is that it does answer perhaps the deepest question of all as far as biology is concerned, which is how do we come to have on this planet such beautifully elegant, complicated things which look as though they've been designed, whence the illusion of design which is so powerful in the living world. So many of the philosophers we speak to who join us on the show say they've had intellectual heroes or people who have been particularly influential on their own thinking. So some examples from previous guests, Pat Churchland said her philosophical hero was Francis Crick. Susan Blackmore said William James and Darwin. Richard Swinburne and Rebecca Buxton said they had hashtag no heroes. Has there been anybody particularly influential on your own thinking, Richard? Well, Darwin himself, obviously. Mm -hmm. August Weissmann, mm -hmm. who formulated the idea of the separation of the germ line from the soma. And I think that's immensely important in what, in what I do. Peter Medower, the immunologist, for his wonderful, clear-thinking, witty essays. Mm. That'll do for the moment. And a final introductory question that we like to ask our guests is whether they've changed their minds on any significant philosophical questions throughout their lives. So to take two examples from previous guests, the first is Yujin Nagasawa, who told us that he converted from atheism through the ontological argument, and Rutger Bregman the other way around, 
from theism to atheism after reading the work of Bertrand Russell. Have there been any big changes like this in your own thinking? Well, like all children, I suppose, like almost all children, I was brought up in a theistic educational environment. And so mm. I, I believed and I no longer do. So I suppose that would be the main one. Mm. Was there anything in particular that drew you away from theism? A, a revelation of some kind, some work you discovered? Not exactly a revelation. I did read Bertrand Russell, like the previous person you mentioned, both why I'm not a Christian and what I believe mm. in the school library. But I think mostly it was an understanding of the power of Darwinian evolution that mm. finally broke it for me. Part one, why I'm an atheist. So before we get into why you're an atheist, perhaps we should get clear on what atheism means. So how should we define atheism and what are the central features of the atheistic worldview? I don't feel very strongly about this because I realize that different people mean different things. And some people would define atheism as a positive belief that there is nothing supernatural. Others mm -hmm. would define it as a lack of belief that there is something supernatural. I have formulated a seven-point scale in The God Delusion from zero, which would be the equivalent of Jung, who said, I not only believe in God, I know there is a God. And mm -hmm. a seven would be, I know there is no God. I put myself at a 6.9. But that's not really saying very much, because I would say the same thing about fairies and leprechauns mm -hmm. and unicorns and things. I mean, you cannot actually be sure mm -hmm. that there are no fairies. And I feel the same way about anything supernatural. But it would be a betrayal, I think, of everything that science stands for mm. to abandon the scientific principles and go for the supernatural, which means inaccessible to science, inaccessible to reason forever. In a lot of debates or lectures that you give, some people say, oh, Richard, you're actually an agnostic and they think they've got you because they, you describe yourself as an atheist. How would you differentiate your type of agnosticism how is it you'll push towards the 6.9 rather well, than sitting in the middle of the To scale? some people, agnosticism means that not only do we not know, but there's a kind of 50-50 mm. probability. And that is very far from my feeling. I'm agnostic about God mm -hmm. and Zeus and Thor in the same way that I am agnostic about leprechauns. Is there anything you'd put on the scale of one to seven? Square circles, married bachelors? Well, yes, stuff? anything that's logically impossible, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And actually... It's perhaps a bit cowardly to say 6.9, maybe 6.999. <laughs> so if we visited a local synagogue church or mosque here in Oxford today and asked the occupants why they believe in the God of Abraham, they might point us in the direction of their holy books. So if a believer cites religious texts as offering historical evidence, Moses' parting of the Red Sea, Christ's resurrection, Muhammad's flight to heaven, would these not provide some, if not an inkling of evidence? <laughs> not at all. Towards no, I mean, God. There's no decent evidence that any of those things happened, and of course they didn't happen. So I think you talk about this in your book, Outgrowing God, and you say, well, a theist might say that the synoptic gospels, they come along later than the Old Testament texts. And there's lots of religious believers, philosophers, in fact, who say there's lots of historical evidence for Christ's resurrection. And this shows that all the things that would have otherwise been blasphemous before God's resurrection of Christ God says, they have my approval now. So what of those eyewitnesses and of the evidence that theists say that... I'm accustomed to the point that, you know, the one thing they dig their toes in about is Jesus' hmm. resurrection. It never happened. I mean, why on earth would you think it happened any more than Elvis has been seen on Mars? You know, <laughs> I mean, when somebody like Elvis dies or Princess Diana, legends start to abound. Hmm. And that's just what happened with Jesus. His disciples desperately wanted him to come back. And the Gospels that we have were written decades after Jesus lived, if he lived at all. The legends about Elvis and Princess Diana were written immediately afterwards, not 30 years afterwards. So people are quite understandably blown away by the natural world's complexity. So the philosopher William Paley tapped into the sense of admiration, claiming that the world's fine-tuned mechanisms, such as the human eye and the sting of a bee, resemble those of a telescope and pocket watches. What would you say to the surprisingly high number of theists who claim that eyes and stingers couldn't have come about through natural selection? Well, they haven't really understood and looked at the literature enough. They don't know enough about it. The eye is one that Darwin himself talked about, and he began by saying that it worried him. It never really worried him because he had a perfectly good answer, which he gave himself. 
The eye evolved by slow, gradual degrees, and mm-hmm. the steps by which it evolved are easily understood, both in terms of physics and in terms of the biology of the animal kingdom. If you look around the animal kingdom, you see all the intermediate stages of half eyes and quarter eyes and eighth eyes and tenth eyes and three-quarter eyes. They're all there in various invertebrate mm-hmm. animals. And the final perfection of an eye is something like an eagle is just the end product of a whole series of gradual incremental stages, incremental improvements. Even if that were not the case, even if biologists were so far baffled by a particular instance, if you said to me, if you challenge me to explain the evolution of the shoulder blade of the mm. lesser spotted brace girdle, and I said, well, I don't know enough about it. Let's put a student onto it. I mean, let's investigate it. Mm. The fact that I can't immediately answer it the way Darwin and indeed I and others have answered the I question, doesn't mean that we can't answer it, it just means we haven't looked at it yet. Well, in your new book, Flights of Fancy, which is excellent, by the way, I know very little about evolutionary biology, particularly about flight and birds and so on, and I was really captivated by it. But one of your chapters is dedicated to this question of what's the good in half a wing? Yes. You might say, well, the intermediary stages between having no wing and a full wing won't be much use to birds or creatures of this kind. How would you respond to this objection when they say, well, you can't just sprout a wing, that's too big. No, that's right, you can't can't just, I mean, the idea is that a swift or an eagle has a beautiful whole wing and it flies beautifully with it, but but Mm. with half a wing it couldn't do it. But with half a wing, with a quarter of a wing, with a tenth of a wing, you have a slightly greater chance of being airborne in, for example, a squirrel, Mm. which jumps from one branch to another. Well, a squirrel without any sort of wings, nothing like a wing, can jump a certain distance, Mm -hmm. maybe a a meter, maybe two meters, and reach the next branch Mm -hmm. a meter away. Well, if it had ever so much, ever so slight an increase in surface area, a slight membrane stretched between the arm and the ribs, Mm -hmm. that would increase the distance it could leap without falling to the ground. So if it could leap one meter without this little membrane, a little bit of membrane could enable it to leap, I say, a meter and a half. Mm -hmm. And then you just increase the size of the membrane a bit further and it can leap yet that much further. Now we see in the forests of Southeast Asia and Africa and Australia, we see animals which have a membrane, squirrels, for example, which have a membrane stretching from the front legs to the back legs. Mm. And they can't exactly fly, but they can glide a hundred meters in a very graceful fashion and they can land safely on a lower tree. Well, it's not that much distance to go from that to a bat. Mm. While in this gliding, they do actually manipulate their limbs and they steer Mm. by that means. Well, that's not very different from flapping. The bridge from a flying squirrel, so-called flying squirrel, which is easy to understand in Mm. evolutionary terms, to a bat is not very great. So yes, once again, what's the use of half a wing is so easy to explain. It's just not a problem. Let us pause for a moment to say a quick thank you to all our God-fearing patrons for making the show possible. In particular, a very special thank you to the man on the highway to hell, it's Mr. Adam Cool. Looking forward to his just dessert, it's Andrew Cherryman. He's not the Messiah, he's a very naughty boy, it's the life of Brian Ramirez. Peddling myths of magic and messiahs, it's Pedalo. Angel or demigod? Who cares? It's the divinely gifted St. David Ligeness. Round and round she goes in the eternal flames of hell. It's Miss Lily Hooper. Praise Jesus, says John Breeden. Hoping Judgment Day never comes around. It's John Gautier. He wouldn't mind a peck from Judas. It's Michael Kiss Lee. Pitying the fool who goes to church. It's Mr. T. Breathing new life into atheism. It's Jamie Lung. The unmoved mover, that is J. Wheelless. And the man whose name is more perplexing than the Trinity itself, it's Miron van der Kolk. If you would like to keep the Pansycast evolving, then please head over to the patreon.com slash Pansycast to show your support. Right, let's jump back into the discussion. One thing I do find striking, and it was interesting, I was watching your debate or discussion here at Oxford with Rowan Williams, which took place maybe 10 years ago now, and Rowan's joining us on the show in in the next episode. And Rowan, like many philosophers or theologians or even scientists these days, are perplexed by the mystery of consciousness and not just how physical things came to evolve a a wing or an eye, but there seems something more difficult about the what it's likeness to be a human being or to be any anything in the non-human animal kingdom. 
Consciousness is the biggest mystery facing biology at the Mm. moment, and it's clearly something to do with brains, Mm -hmm. and it's something that manifests itself in brains when brains reach a certain level of complexity. We don't know at what stage in the evolution of vertebrates, Mm -hmm. maybe invertebrates, uh, consciousness arose. We don't know. It's not even clear what consciousness does for you, Mm. which couldn't be done by an unconscious robot. You could imagine, indeed, you could actually program a robot to do most of the things that humans do. I don't know about everything. Mm. You probably know about the Turing test, Mm -hmm. whether a computing machine could fool somebody into thinking that they are conscious. That will probably be solved. The Turing test will probably be passed. Mm. Even so, it might not be conscious in the same sense as I am and you are. At least I suppose you are. I've no evidence you are. I guess you are because you come from the same kind of source as I did and the mm. same sort of embryology as I did and the same sort of evolution. So something about the evolutionary process of the evolution of the brain led to consciousness. Mm. It was probably a gradual process. It would probably not have been the sudden turning on of a light. It probably would have been more a dimmer switch, mm. gradually increasing the level of consciousness. I don't know whether fish are conscious. I don't know whether newts are conscious. I'd be pretty surprised if chimpanzees weren't mm-hmm. and dogs aren't. But it is a mystery. It's not a mystery that's solved by supernatural means. I mean, that's yeah. just co- it's a cop-out. It must be explicable as a manifestation of mm. brain mechanisms, but has yet to be understood. Another argument, essentially in the same field, fine-tuning is one which theists and philosophers of religion have moved away from. So most educated philosophers of religion would say, I accept Darwin's theory of natural selection. But one thing which is still, in addition to the mystery of consciousness, that they can't seem to get their heads around, is the seemingly fine-tuningness of the universe. So, a quote from your own book, Outgrowing God, you say, If the gravitational constant was smaller than it is, there'd be no galaxies, no stars, no chemistry, no planets, no evolution, and no life. If the gravitational constant had been just a little bit bigger than it is, stars couldn't exist. They'd all collapse under their own gravity. There are more than a dozen of these constants. And in all cases, if their value were different, the universe as we know it could not exist. Now, when we spoke to Richard Swinburne, he was pretty adamant, let's say, that God and not chance alone offers the simplest explanation for the world's delicately balanced constants. He says that the findings of physics and the laws we're discovering and their fine-tuning this point us towards a creator rather than away from one. Do you see this as one of the more powerful arguments? No, you... I mean, at least in one way it is, but certainly not the way Swinburne puts it. Okay. I mean, to call God simple is absolutely ludicrous. Mm. And I know Swinburne does this. He says, well, God is just one thing. Yeah. Of course God isn't just one thing. If God's capable of working out the physical constants, exactly how to twiddle the knobs of the gravitational constant and all the other constants that mm. have to be exactly fine-tuned, then the one thing he cannot be is simple. He's got to be very, very complex indeed which simply means it's not an explanation at all. You simply push the problem back to a previous stage. So it's a total non-explanation. Now, there are a few genuine attempts at explanation, Mm -hmm. of which the one physicists mostly favor is the metaverse, the multiverse, I Mm -hmm. mean, where one of the consequences of the inflationary model of the universe is that you have a very large number of universes in parallel, Mm -hmm. which have different values of the fundamental constants. and This is where the anthropic principle kicks in. We have to be in one of that tiny minority of universes in which the physical constants are such as to produce galaxies and planets and chemistry and life and us. So if you allow the multiverse, and there are other reasons for allowing it, physicists tell me, then the multiverse theory does account for, plus the anthropic principle, does account for the fine tuning Mm -hmm. Another approach which is taken by some physicists is to say we just don't yet understand enough and there will be a grand general theory, a grand unified theory, a theory of everything in which the values of the fundamental constants will be explained. We will not just have to assume them as having the value that they do. There will be an explanation for everything. So those are two possible explanations mm-hmm. and I think most physicists go for the multiverse at present. You've mentioned this a couple of times that in relation to consciousness, in relation to the universes, fine-tuned nature, we can just keep doing the work, right? And that's something that scientists should be doing. We spoke to A.C. Grayling, one of your fellow atheists, who accused, quote, of believing in God as being determined to bring human inquiry and curiosity to an end. Theism is perfect for somebody who doesn't want to think and is afraid, lonely, old, 
or intellectually lazy, which is quite a damning review of the theist's worldview. Do you think that theism inherently involves a giving up on those questions? Of course it does. Exactly right. Because it is a non-answer to the question. Mm. It simply gives up. It says, oh, God did it. And we don't have to ask questions anymore. Science goes on working. Science goes on asking the question, goes on trying to unravel Mm. the mysteries of nature. It doesn't just lie down and give up and say, oh, well, God did it. Mm. What if you were to ignore the God of the Abraham believers believe in? What about just the God of metaphysics, that God of this mind that's a cause? Something it's not an explanation. Means. I mean, it, we do need a proper explanation. Now, as a biologist, as an evolutionary biologist, I'm accustomed to the power of the Darwinian idea, which starts with something relatively simple, not mm. ultimately simple, but relatively simple, and builds up by gradual degrees to the sort of complexity that, as Hume says, ravishes into admiration, all have ever contemplated it. Mm. Um, Now, that's a powerful scientific theory. That takes simplicity as its starting point and builds up through successive stages into the magnificent complexity which life shows today. Well, we need something like that in physics, in Mm. cosmology. And it's not so certain what that something is at the moment. Mm -hmm. But that's the kind of thing we need. The supernatural way of answering the question is not a way of answering it at all. It's simply giving up. So would you give a similar answer to that, to the cosmological argument, which is that since the Big Bang, which hypothesizes that the Big Bang had a beginning that is not infinite, and as everything that begins must exist, must have a cause, the Big Bang must also have a cause, and this is called God. Well, yes, it may have a cause, But it's going to be a very simple cause, otherwise it's not an explanation. Mm. And God is not simple, as I said before. If we must have a cause for the Big Bang, whatever else the cause is, it will not be something complicated. It won't be God. And do you have any thoughts on how we might come to know how something such as the Big Bang came from nothing? You'd have to ask a physicist. I have read Lawrence Krauss's book, A Universe from Nothing, Mm. and he answered it in terms of quantum theory. And I can repeat his words, but that doesn't mean I understand them because I'm not a physicist. So as science progresses in the way that Darwin's discovery of how complex creatures arose in the world and life evolves, do you think a similar type of thing is going to happen with the origin of the universe and consciousness? Do you think that Darwin's discovery gives fuel to the... Yes, I I do. I think that what Darwin did for life we need physicists to do for the rest of the universe. Mm. And I think that Darwin should give us courage because you quoted William Paley earlier. I mean, Paley himself said the cosmos or the the universe, the physical world, is not the best argument. Mm -hmm. He said by far the best argument is life. Mm -hmm. And he rather skated over the physical world. He mentioned the Saturn's ring. Mm. In those days, just one ring as being the only complicated thing. And there's not really complicated enough to give pause. Mm. So he went straight to biology. Well, Darwin solved that. So what Paley recognized as the difficult problem, Darwin solved. That should give us courage Mm. and say that something like that, the explanation of complexity in terms of simplicity, will come in physics, in cosmology, and Darwin will give us the courage to go on looking for it. Before 1859 on The Origin of Species, if you were around in a bookshop in 1802 and you picked up natural theology from Paley, do you think before 1859 when... Paley's books and all these other writings around, you might be more persuaded towards yes. theism. Well, yes, I do. I mean, I mean, Darwin himself read Paley at Cambridge and was mm. very persuaded by it. I suppose I would have been, and I think you quoted me earlier as saying that before Darwin was very Tenable, difficult, but, yeah. difficult to be an atheist. I now don't think that. I mean, mm. I take back that. I don't think that actually, even before Darwin, theism was a coherent point of view. I would rather have said, well, I don't understand how life's complexity came into being. Mm. But whatever it is, the God explanation isn't a good explanation. There must Mm. be something else. And we'll have to wait and see what it is. In a way, I'm surprised that, for example, Hume, who kind of expressed that kind of skepticism, didn't tumble to evolution by natural selection, which is a very simple idea. It's Mm. it's not difficult. I mean, it doesn't require deep mathematics. Mm -hmm. It's a rather easier idea to understand than many of Newton's ideas, for example, Mm -hmm. 200 years earlier. And I find it an interesting historical puzzle why a Darwin didn't come along until the middle of the 19th century. For now, that will remain a mystery. The Mystery Philosopher. So you're both going to hear the quotes from a philosopher from the past, a philosopher or scientist. You'll have to try and tell me who you think this might be. 
The nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, the carbon in our apple pies were made in the interiors of collapsing stars. We are all made of star stuff. Any idea who that might be? Carl Sagan. It's Carl Sagan. Very good, Richard. Thank you again for joining us for another installment of the Fan Sidecast. Join us next time when we'll be continuing our conversation with Richard, as well as asking some of your listener questions. We'll see you then. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sidecast. The next installment of this episode will be available a week on Sunday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the next installment of the show. To support the podcast and get yourself heaps of extra perks, head over to www.patreon.com forward slash pan or hit the link in the iTunes description. To find out more about the show and get all of our old episodes completely free, you can visit thepansycast.com. From all of us here at The Pan Sidecast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That was great. That was really good. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, it was good. Wow. (laughs) That was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're doing a wonderful thing with this. (laughs)